Good evening, good evening, good evening. Let me thank our praise and worship team, Brother Larry, and our praise and worship team for leading us in worship and reminding us about the great God that we serve. I hope you've had a great day today. Uh, I am in Florida again this particular week. I'm live in Orlando. I want to give a shout out to our First Baptist Church of Vietnam production team. A couple of these really sharp guys are here uh, setting up my hotel room with cameras and technical equipment so me, so I can come to you live tonight. So let me give them a shout out. They got up early this morning and caught a flight at six o'clock to be able to come, come here and set it up. And I want them to know how grateful I am. If you're joining us for the first time tonight, we welcome you to First Baptist Church of Glen Arden. Tonight is our Tuesday night Bible study that we do every week. And uh, if you're a first timer, just put a one in the in the chat so you can let our other uh, individuals know who are in the chat that you are first time with us. And wherever you are in the country coming, I'm grateful that you've joined us. Um, looks like we got people from Michigan and Tennessee, Florida, North Carolina, New Jersey, South Carolina, Georgia, New York, California, Pennsylvania, Louisiana, shouting y'all out, Connecticut, Indiana, Mississippi, and we got four international locations, St. Vincent, the Grenadines, Somalia, Russia, and Puerto Rico. Thank you all for joining us wherever you are in the world. It's my joy and my honor that you carve out the time out of your schedule to come and be with us on Tuesday night. I'm going to pray and then we're going to dive into our lesson for the night. So let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your loving kindness and tender mercies. Thank you for your, uh, just your, your loving kindness to us, that you extend to us your mercy and your patience. I pray that you would bless our time and your word today. Make this word clear. Let hearts be open and receptive to hear your truth. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would uh, give this revelation of what Paul is saying uh, to somebody's heart, somebody's mind, and in their spirit, that they would comprehend and know what the Spirit is saying to the church today. I thank you. I give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are in Romans chapter 10. Let me welcome you to Romans chapter 10 tonight. Um, for those of you who may not uh, remember, know or remember, we are listening to Paul's uh, dialogue with the church in Rome. He's, he's in Corinth and he's writing to them from Corinth to Rome. Uh, and he's talking to a church primarily composed of Gentiles and some Jews. These are uh, uh, Gentiles who've accepted Jesus Christ and they are uh, basically um, getting instructions, getting some theological instructions from Paul. And his instructions to them are critical even to our understanding and our belief. And let me just, you know, head, just right off the, the top tell you that, you know, chapter 10 is like he's going to focus on some of the things he's already been talking about, even in some of the uh, uh, previous chapters. It all boils down to that we are saved by faith. And, you know, I, I find it a amazing that he, he's repeating it over and over and over again and uh, approaching it from different perspectives and different mindsets and from different angles because he's trying to drive home a truth that we are not saved by works. Uh, I told our music department on Sunday uh, in one of the services they sang a song that would make some people believe that you know you have to climb a rough mountain you have to climb up and do your best to make it in, to get into heaven. And I, I told our music guys, hey, we can't sing that song no more. That's, that's not biblically accurate. The truth of the matter is we are saved by faith alone. All right, so let's, let's open up and let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 10. And let's start with uh, these first few verses. The first uh, 13 verses deal with... Uh, that the fact that righteousness is by faith alone. That's what the whole first 13 verses are about. Getting the concept to the people in Rome that righteousness being in right standing with God is solely based on faith 
alone. Now, for chapter 10 is such a significant chapter, and you're going to see in a few moments, it highlights actually some of the key verses we use in our Romans Road to Salvation. Uh, there are several passages we use throughout the book of Romans. Uh, and this, this whole uh, um, 10th chapter homes in on the fact that uh, we are saved by faith. So let's look at these first 13 verses. I'm going to begin at verse 1. Here's what it says. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. That is his first uh, challenge. That's the heart's desire of of uh, Paul, he says, I'm I'm hoping and I'm praying, and I believe I believe above above all that uh, Israel will be saved. He says, I'm hoping that my people would accept Jesus Christ, and all that all of Israel would be saved. Uh, and I'm I'm hoping that you all get that. That's verse one. That's what it means. Paul again reveals his heart's passion is to see his people in Israel saved. Verse 2 says this, For I bear witness, for I bear them witness, that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Um, I don't know, are we putting the verses up, Mike? Do we have the verses? Uh, not, not my verses, but the, the Bible verses. We are? Okay. Okay, all right. Um, uh he says, I'm, bearing, I'm testifying that they have an energy, they have a zeal for God, but it's not according to the knowledge that the Lord wants them to have. That's his point. His point is they're enthusiastic, but they're not enthusiastic for the things that God wants them to be enthusiastic about. They have a zeal for God, but it's not based on the knowledge that God has extended to us to have. God wants us to have knowledge. He wants us to have the knowledge of his truth, not of our truth. That's verse, that's verse 2. So they, they have a zeal for God, but it's not based on God's knowledge. Verse 3 says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness, they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. And isn't that the way so many people are today? They are seeking to be righteous based on their own guidelines. And y'all, this is clear. Oh my goodness, this is so important. You can't determine, you can't make the decision. You cannot decide on what's righteous before God. That That's not, God doesn't give us the authority or the power or the might or put us in a position to be able to think that we can come and make a determination to God of, of what's the standard that he will accept. And that's what he's saying. He says Israel is, has been ignorant of what God requires for righteousness and they sought to establish, they sought to bring to the table their own righteousness and they refused to be submitted to the righteousness that God established. And I want you and I to understand that. A lot of the, your friends and a lot of your relatives and co-workers and people that you love and care about in the, in somewhere in their heart and mind, they've concluded that what they think makes righteousness, they think that they can make the determination of what was righteous before God. And that's a dangerous thing to say. I want y'all to, that's one of those verses you got to highlight to show to people sometimes when you are ministering to somebody. They, they need to understand you cannot create your own standards. You cannot create your own, what you determine is righteous. And unfortunately, Israel have not submitted to what God calls for, for righteousness. That's verse number three. So they are seeking to be righteous, but they're basing it on their own guidelines. That's what verse three is telling us. They are seeking to be righteous, but they're basing it on what they think is right. Verse four. I love this verse right here. This is another profound, powerful verse. It says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Oh my goodness gracious. That's a powerful verse. Christ is the end. When he came, when Jesus came, when he came, he brought an end to being righteous by the law for the believer. We, we don't get, when we put our faith in Jesus, we're, we're done with trying to please God based on the law. We're not trying to keep the law. 
We're not trying to dot every I and cross every T to be right with God. Righteousness is not achieved in the eyes of God by us keeping the law. And verse 4 says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. But that's only true to those who believe. So when you put your faith in the Lord and you believe in Jesus and you believe he died and was buried and rose again from the dead, there's the end of you trying to be righteous with God based on what the law says. We're not righteous based on that. Verse number five. Let's read verse number five. It says, for Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. If you're trying to get righteous by the law, you got to do what the law says. That's what he's saying. The man who does those things has got to live by what the law says. And the problem is you can't keep all the law. It's impossible for you to keep your law. You can't dot every I and cross every T. That's, that is such a profound reality. Moses wrote, verse 5, about the law and righteousness. And to be righteous by the law requires those who do that to follow the law. We cannot keep and obey all of the commandments of the law. You can't do it. I can't do it. That's not, that is not a standard that we can keep. Even if we wanted to, we couldn't do it. And y'all, y'all, we need, we need to know that our human flesh is incapable, unable to be righteous based on keeping the law. And that's what Moses says. Verse number six, matter of fact, I'm going to read verses six through eight next. Let's read verses six through eight. Here's what it says, verses six through eight. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. Now, here's how those three verses, verses 6, 7, and 8, I've concluded it by writing this little, this little phrase for verses 6, 7, and 8. That righteousness by faith says, don't say that you will ascend in, into heaven or will descend, but it does declare that we preach from our mouth. We make a declaration about what we're going to do and what our life is going to be based on what comes out of our mouth. Our mouth speaks. And, and that's what gives us the power and the ability based on what we believe in our hearts. That's what gives us the capacity and the ability to walk by faith. So righteousness of faith speaks this way, that I'm not working my way up to heaven or working my way down to hell, descending into the abyss. Uh, but in fact, the word is near me and in my mouth and it's in my heart. It's in my heart. The word is in my heart. The word of faith which we preach. So we declare that we're preaching it. And then it brings us to verse number nine. And oh my goodness, verse number nine is such a significant verse. This is one of our salvation verses. Here's what it says. Verse nine. I'm going to spend, let me spend a few moments on this verse right here. Here's what it says. Verse nine. Let me slow down. Slow down, pastor. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, I'm going to come back to that in a moment, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Stick a pen in. That's one of those key verses. Let, let me break it down. If you confess with your mouth, here's key, the Lord Jesus. That key word is Lord. That you're confessing, that you're willing for him to be the Lord of your life that you're willing to let him run your life, be in charge of your life, call the shots, be the master of your life, Lord Jesus. See, some people never get to the place of salvation because they just, they want to just acknowledge the existence of a Jesus. The Muslims believe that Jesus existed. Many people believe he just existed, but they're not willing to uh, confess with their mouth that he's Lord. They're not willing to surrender their life to the Lord Jesus. And he says, Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Those are two critical things. He's Lord of your life, and you believe that he died on the cross, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. When he talks about he got raised from the dead, that's encompassing the whole story of his death on the cross, his burial, 
and the fact that God raised him from the dead. And if you do that, you make him Lord, you yield to his lordship in your life, and you believe in the core of your heart that God raised him from the dead, here's what the scripture says, you will be saved. Now this is something I try to and want to try to per per perpetrate and preach and declare to every one of our altar counselors that when you take somebody back to the back rooms in our church or you're witnessing to somebody and you're communicating with someone, it becomes critical and important that you say and preach and declare to them how important it is for them to confess the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart that what Jesus did on the cross was sufficient for their salvation. They have to believe in their heart that what he did on the cross was sufficient for their sins to be washed away. That's the, that's the critical thing in verse, verse 9. That's powerful, profound, amazing. It is, it, is the, it is one of the cornerstone verses of what we share with people who want Jesus in their life. If you don't know any other verse by heart, I want you to learn this verse by heart. Word perfect, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's a promise from God. Verse 10, let me go to verse 10. I'm, uh, and then it says this, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. With the heart one believes unto righteousness. What you believe in your heart places you into a posture of being in right standing with God and with your mouth, your confession that comes out of your mouth and with the mouth's confession is made unto salvation. What you confess secures your salvation. That's critical. It's key. It's, as a matter of fact, that's what uh, verse 10, I say it is with the heart that, uh, that believes that one is righteous and the confession of the mouth salvation is confirmed. God confirms our salvation. That becomes absolutely critical for us to comprehend and understand that our salvation is confirmed by what we verbalize and say. Verse 11. Let's read verse 11. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. I like that verse too. The scriptures declare that those who believe him will have shame removed. That's what that means. Because guess what? We've all done things that we're ashamed of. We are ashamed of choices and decisions and actions we've taken. We are ashamed of how we have failed, how we missed the mark. But the scripture declares that when you believe in Jesus, he will remove your shame. Y'all know a lot of people who are ashamed of what they did and how they've lived, but the great news from the Savior that we serve is that he wipes the shame away. You don't have to be ashamed of your past. Jesus, because he loves us, he will not allow shame to condemn us. Verse number 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. I like that verse too, verse 12. Stick a pin on that. That's powerful and profound. In the eyes of God, there's not Jew and Gentile. There's not Jew or Greek. For the same Lord over all, he's, Jesus is Lord over anyone who confesses him, whether they're Jew or Greek, whether they're Jew or Gentile. For the same Lord over all, look at here, is rich to all. He's rich. He will extend the riches of his grace, the riches of his person, the riches of his mercy, the riches of his patience. He will extend to us his riches to all who do what? Call upon him. Call upon him. Tell, if you just tell your unsaved people to make their confession to Jesus, call on him. God makes no distinction between Jew and Greek. He is rich to all who call on him. Call upon the Lord and he saves, saves you. Verse 13 even follows up with that. Verse 13 says, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever calls upon the Lord shall be saved. You reach out to God here. That's another one of those verses we use for 
leading people to salvation is verse 13, that anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God has the capacity and the ability and the willingness to save you and I. He will save you. Isn't that great news? It's profound. It's powerful. It's, it's exciting. It's, it's great that we serve a God who is so merciful and so patient and so willing to bring us to a posture or a place to be able to have a relationship with him. And I don't know where y'all are, but I'm so thankful to God for that. He is wonderful, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Now let me back up for a second, because last week somebody asked a question, and I, I saw the question after we logged off. Because, you know, the question, I, I can't remember the exact question, but it, it was like, are we predestined? And we talked to some of those verses. And, you know, uh, there are verses, and this is one of the great co controversies in the body of Christ as to whether we are predestined or whether God predetermined who would be saved and who wouldn't be saved. Uh, it's a big debate. And so you can find people who believe in predestination and you can find people who believe in free will. But Pastor Jenkins, what do you believe? I'm probably right in the middle. I'm a mixture. I believe that I'm saved because God predetermined me to be saved. He, he woke me up. He gave me grace. He opened my eyes. That's what we talked about last week, that God has to open your eyes for you to get saved. So I, I do believe that God does that. But I also believe he gives us a free will. I believe he gives us the option and the opportunity to call upon his name. And so um, I believe in the core of my being that God knows who will and God knows who won't. And so he sets, he, he knows our character and our makeup and our personality and how he made us. And he knows those who are hard headed and whose hearts are hardened. He knows about that. He knows whose heart will never get, because he's a sovereign God who knows everything. And he knows those who will respond to his voice. So whether you want to call that predestined or not, uh, we, we, our best shot, what we are called to do is to share the gospel with people, pray for them, intercede for them, and call on the Lord to bring them to a place of salvation. Call on the Lord to bring them to a place of committing to him. Call on the Lord for them, pray for them, intercede for them, and we want to believe that God is going to save them and give them faith to believe. So that's, that's the first section and that first section deal, the first 13 verses, highlights and focuses on the point that we are saved and made righteous with God by faith alone, period. Now, the next section deals with uh, the fact that in verses 14 through 21, through the end of the chapter, that God uh, has, makes us know that Israel rejected the gospel. They reject the, the, the story of what Jesus did for their salvation. And that's why Jews today are uh, un, those who are unsaved. There are some Jews who have accepted Jesus, but uh, by and large, most of them have not accepted Jesus. And so uh, Paul talking to the church in Rome is letting them know um, that there's so many have rejected the gospel. So let's go, let's look at verse 14. And let's start there. Verse number 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That's a profound verse right there. What is that saying? You cannot believe in this gospel unless you hear it. That's why preaching is so important. That's why the essence of preaching the gospel is important. It cannot be heard without a preacher. This is what this verse is saying. We, you cannot hear unless God sends a preacher to share it with you, to proclaim his truth to you. How shall they hear unless somebody makes the declaration? And, and then he says in verse number 15, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. That's verse 15. You can't preach if you have not been sent. You know, there's a lot of people who are trying to preach, but they ain't been sent. And here's what the scripture says. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel, who, who, take it, who accept the call and the mandate from God 
to take the gospel. Some of you have been called. Some of you just went. <laughs> but many of you have a call and an assignment on your life to share the gospel, to preach and make the proclamation to other people. I, I want to encourage you to listen to the voice of God because how beautiful is your are your feet, is your path. When he talks about your feet, how beautiful is the path and the walk that you take for those who preach the gospel of peace. Uh, and you bring glad tidings of good things. As a matter of fact, these verses, Isaiah 52, 7 and Nahum 115 are verses that Paul is rehearsing and preaching that are located in those those two passages, Isaiah 52, 7 and Nahum 115. He's rehearsing uh, in verse 15 uh, those proclamations, those statements that were made in the Old Testament that he is saying now this is the reality and the promise and the power of what the, the gospel does for us. And so I want to salute the, the, the life and the hands of those who have picked up the gospel and made a decision and a choice to preach the gospel that Jesus brings to us. Verse 16 says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Here's what he's saying. He's saying the Jews have not all submitted to the gospel. And Isaiah make the declaration, Lord, who's going to believe what we're declaring? Who's going to believe the report that we're preaching? That's what he's saying. And, and what he's saying is, uh, he's, he's suggesting, he's affirming that all of the Jews have not accepted Jesus. And, it, and guess what? It's not just Jews who haven't accepted Jesus. We got a lot of Gentiles. One of my statistics that I recently, I've been probably quoting this verse, uh, this statistic for a long time. 80% of Americans are not involved or engaged in, in a church. Not, in, not believers, not f walking out and following the truth of God's word. 80 over, it's probably over 80% now since the pan, since the pandemic, the number's probably, you know, 85 or 90% of people. That means nine out of the 10 people you know have chosen not to believe the report of the word of God. And it's tragic, it's sad. Who, he says, who has believed our report? And then verse 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing, verse 17. And hearing by the word of God, we get our faith ex lifted up by hearing the word of God. Uh, I was telling somebody recently how important it is for you to build up your faith. You got to build up your faith. And faith comes when you hear the word of God, when you hear God's truth and you hear God's word. That's what builds your faith. So he says, uh, in verse 17, faith comes when you hear the word of God. When you hear how God's hand is moved, that's what builds your faith. When you hear how God moved in the past, how he opened up the Red Sea for Moses and the children of Israel, how he kept Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, how he healed the woman with the issue of blood. We can go on and on and hear the story after story of the power of God working and exhibiting himself in the life of people. That's what builds your faith. That's what gives you the confidence to know that if God can do it for them, he can do it for you too. I don't care what you're facing in life. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Get in that word. Read that word. Meditate on that word. Memorize that word. Get that word in your heart. And know that God, he has not stopped being God. He's the same God today that he was a, a thousand years ago. The same thing he did for the children of Israel. The same miracles he wrought for other people. He can and will do the same for you. And I think about the story after story in my own personal life. And I, you know what? I regret that I didn't write down the testimonies of the things that God did in my own personal life. If I had to do it over again, I would have kept a journal. I started keeping it out. I wish I had maintained it and kept it because I look back over my life and I see some things that God did, especially with the First Baptist Church of Lenore. And I remember uh, uh, challenges we had when we were in the ministry center, uh, challenges when we didn't think we were going to be able to buy the building, challenges when we didn't think we would be able to build out the building, challenges when there was a strike with construction workers and oh, so many things. And God worked it out. God caused things to happen to show us he was with us. And that's why I've got so much faith today because I can look back over my life. And you got stories in your life. 
I'm sure you got things that you've seen God do that you say, you know what? I saw God work this out. And, and he, what am I saying to you? I'm saying to you, build your faith up by reading the word of God. Hearing and rehearsing the scriptures in your heart. Faith comes when you hear the word of God. Verse 17. Let me go to verse 18. But I, but, but I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Profound. Oh boy, this thing has, this has so many profound things. Let me, let me, let me tell you this first, right? Let me, here's verse 18. Indeed, everyone has heard, even those who have not heard his name have heard the sound that God has sent out to all the earth. They, they might not even, you know, somebody said, what about people who never heard about Jesus? One, 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 I talk to a lot of people who say, how, how, how can God send people to hell who never heard the name of Jesus? And, and this, word, this verse is saying, um, even if they never heard his name, they heard about the character and makeup of who the God is that we serve. They've heard it in their soul. They've heard it in their conscience. They heard about a God that they must answer to. They, and that's what they have to answer. If they never heard about Jesus, they will have to answer to how they responded to the, to the standard that God placed in their conscience. Did they listen to that voice? Did they listen to God? They, they, did they listen to the sound that has gone out in all of the earth? God has sent a sound that he exists. He has sent a sound and he's given words to the ends of the world. Everybody has heard something that tells them that there is a power greater than they are. And they've heard that sound. And so you're accountable, even if you've never heard the name Jesus, you're accountable for responding to the very nature and concept of a God who communicates in your very being and soul. Psalm 19.4, jot that verse down. That's a part, a, a reference in, in Psalm 19.4 is a reference to this particular verse. Indeed, everyone has heard, even those who have not heard his name, have heard the sound that God has sent out to all the earth. And our job as a church is to try to just take the gospel to the ends and the hedges and the highways so nobody can say that they haven't heard his name. It's our job to make sure that they have heard about his name. And even if they don't, they still must answer to what their conscience hears and feels. Verse 19, let's go to verse 19. Verse 19 says, but I say, did Israel not know? First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. That's a profound verse, too. That's also a profound verse. What is he saying? Let me, let me go back and read that one more time. He, but I say, Paul says, did, did Israel not know? Yeah, they knew. First, Moses says, here's what God says. I will provoke you to jealousy. By those who are not a nation, I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. He said, I'm taking people who weren't even a nation and showing, showing myself strong through them, Israel, to provoke you to want to have a relationship with me. Boy, I think this is so powerful because, you know, what causes people to want to follow the God that we serve when they see him doing the miracles in your life? When they see him opening up doors and giving you his blessings and his favor and his miracles. When they see God doing those things in your life that provokes an anger. And that's what God is saying. I did things for people who weren't even a nation, Israel, because I wanted to provoke you to come back to me. That's what God is saying. And, and he said, I wanted to move you to a place of anger by using a foolish people and turn their hearts toward me. And they, they served me. They bowed down to me. He says, I wanted to prove them. I wanted to, to just provoke anger in you that you would make a choice to make, to, to say yes to me and come back and follow me. Verse, verse 19, here's what I wrote. Did Israel not know that Moses declared that God would provoke Israel to jealousy by those who were not even nation? And that's in Deuteronomy 32, 21. Jot that verse down. Deuteronomy 32, 21. That the God we serve uh, was demonstrating and provoking them to Israel, Israel to, to serve him and to be obedient to him and to say yes to him. That's the thing that God is after. That's, 
that uh, that's what he wants. That's what God desires for Israel to do is to do that. Verse 20, uh, he says, but Israel is very bold. But Isaiah, Isaiah, I'm sorry, but Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not, who did not ask for me. That's, this is profound, powerful, verse 2, verses 20 and 21. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. I love this. Oh, my God. This, this shows the very nature and character of God. Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. He said, I'm talking about the people who weren't even pursuing me, but they found me. And he says, I was made manifest to those who didn't ask for me. And then God says, all day long, I've stretched my hands to you, Israel. But to Israel, he said, all day long, this is what God said to him. All day long, I've stretched my hands to you, disobedient and contrary people. And I, and I, you know, I'm I'm coming to a close on this point right here. But I want you to I want you to comprehend and understand this point. That God is even stretching His hand out to Jews and Gentiles. He's stretching His hands out to you, to your friends, to your neighbors, your coworkers. When I stand up on Sunday morning, I know that there are people in the in the building that God is stretching his hands out to them. There's something moving in their hearts. You know, that's why I'm so confident every week when we give the altar call and make the appeal for people to come. I am persuaded and I know that God has brought people there. And I'm encouraging you to bring people to church, too, by the way, who are separated from God, who don't know the God that we serve who don't have a relationship with him, have not accepted him, are not walking in holiness or pleasing him uh, with their lifestyle. I want you to invite them and I want you to minister to them and pray for them and intercede for them and share truth with them and share your story with them and then bring them to church, go drive. And every Sunday I stand up because I know that there are people who, are, who have been disobedient and contrary to God. They turn their backs and their hearts against God. But you know what I know? I know that God has been stretching his hands out to them. And I want you to know that, that I don't care how hard their hearts might appear to be against God. They know that all day long, God's been stretching his hands out to them. Isaiah made that declaration that God was found by those who were not seeking him. This is verses 20 through 21. I'm sorry, I'm a little behind the scene here, a little, a little bit late. Who were not seeking him or asking for him. But God continues to stretch out his hands to a disobedient and contrary people. God loves them even though they're disobedient, even though they're hard-hearted. God is stretching his hands out to them. And guess what? For some of you, he's using you to do it. He's using you as the instrument to talk to your coworkers to pray for them. He's using you to remind them that he's made a way for them to be forgiven of their sins. He uses you, my brothers and sisters. You've got to know that you are, you are the instrument of God. And how, go back to the earlier part of, chapter, of this chapter, how shall they hear without a preacher? You're the preacher. You have the assignment and you have the mantle and you have the call of God upon you to do it. So I want to make that appeal to you. I want to, I, want to, I want to remind you that God is gifting and preparing and using you to be the mouthpiece of God to bring truth and revelation to lost people who are separated from God. And so I want to encourage you to be in the right place with him. I hope I'm making sense to you. I hope you understand it. If you're listening to me today and you don't know the Lord Jesus, you can get to know him. Maybe somebody told you about this Bible study online. Maybe somebody told you about the First Baptist Church of Glenarden. Maybe you live in another country or another state or another city. You can, no matter where you are, you can get saved today. You can get saved tonight. There's going to be a phone number to come up on the screen. There's going to be an email address. There's going to be a button, a button for you to click. Just move your mouse 
over to that little click place and click it and it'll take you to a place to give you instructions and connect you with somebody to lead you to salvation. You can know Jesus tonight. He can wash away your sins and cleanse you and wipe your slate clean. I want to encourage you today. If you're not right with God, if you don't have a, if you don't know him right now would be the time to do that. If you are backslidden, you can rededicate yourself to the Lord. Rededicate yourself to Jesus. Or if you're not sure, if you have questions or doubts or you don't, you don't have assurance, we can help you get blessed assurance. The scriptures are clear that God wants you to know. He doesn't want you living your life. Some people believe that you can't know. Yes, you can. The scripture is clear that we may know that we can have the blessed assurance that we are children of the Most High God. That's crystal clear in scripture, and I want to make that appeal to you to do it. Father, I thank you that by the power of your might, you have spared our lives and you have given us and reached us, even though we were a, a, a people who never put, looked for you or sought you. But God, you brought somebody in our life to preach and make the declaration of the gospel of peace to us. And thank you that you've inclined our hearts to hear. I thank you for that, almighty God. I pray today for somebody who's watching, somebody who, Lord, is standing in the need of hearing the truth of your word. Draw them to yourself, almighty God. In Jesus' wonderful name, I pray. Amen. All right, thank you all for joining me tonight. I'm so, so grateful. Again, let me shout out our production team that have come here and got up and caught an early flight this morning and came and set up in my hotel room, moved the furniture around and been working all day to be ready to serve to, so that you can, so I could do this live. So thank them. And I thank you for joining us wherever you are in the country or in the world. Be blessed. Have a great night. I'll see you next time.